go of the idea that there is a special magic list of jobs available for specific majors. You need to let go of the idea that your career will be defined by your degree or the major that you choose. You also need to let go of the assumption that future careers, i.e. your career, will have the same structure as careers in the past. That they will look like traditional careers where you trained in a specific technical skill for one specific occupation and then you got a job and then you worked your way up the ranks and then you retired. This framework for approaching careers is no longer relevant. The future of work is expected to be so disruptive that careers will be boundaryless, forcing you to move between jobs and occupations to constantly adapt and retrain and upskill. So what is the cause of this, this di dis disruption and this shift towards boundaryless careers? The World Economic Forum has rather dramatically labelled this period of time as the fourth industrial revolution. And what it essentially means for the job market is simply the loss of jobs due to technology, due to automation. The Centre for Economic Development in Australia has forecasted that 40% of current jobs in Australia, 40%, will be lost due to technology over the next 15 to 20 years. And the remaining jobs will be disrupted due to competition. And this highly competitive environment will mean that a tertiary education is no longer a guarantee of employability. And we can already start to see this trend uh, over the past decade. So these are the employment outcomes for bachelor level graduates by study area. And as you can see, pretty much every study area um, in terms of employment prospects has been in decline with the exception of medicine in the blue up the top and teaching, which is the orange just underneath. So it's getting more and more difficult for graduates, for experienced graduates, to break into the job market. And if you're looking for science, which I'm sure you are, it just so happens to be at the very bottom of the pile with creative arts graduates. So kind of depressing. Um, and I was agonizing over whether or not to include this slide, but I think it gives you some context. And we'll move on for it from it before everyone starts to cry. Um, so Deloitte, which is a top consulting firm, they've reported that the half-life of a learned skill will now be only five years. So every five years you will be expected to either upskill or retrain. McCrindle, a leading social research organization, has forecasted that school leavers today will on average have 17 different jobs across five different occupations. Five different occupations. And yet most of you are probably sitting there thinking which single occupation is the right one for you. But careers won't be defined by a single occupation anymore. They'll be defined by a collection of jobs, projects, and experiences. It will be defined by lifelong learning and transferable skills. And this trend towards transferable skills has also been highlighted by the Foundation for Young Australians. And what they're depicting here is that technical skills, i.e. Your, your degree, is just one tiny part of the employability puzzle. The most important things that you will need in order to get a job and to maintain employment are transferable skills. So skills like communication, confidence, critical thinking, creativity, in addition to your ability to self-manage your career. To self-manage your career. No one's going to do it for you. Now I'm not saying that your science degree isn't important. What I'm saying is that you need to change your understanding as to why your science degree is important. Pretty much every report on the future of work has concluded that creative people trained in maths and science will be the most in-demand and qualified workers for the future labour market. And it's not because of the technical skills that you learn in your degree, like preparing, 
it's because of the way scientists are trained. So you're trained to take a problem, to critically review it, to come up with new ideas to resolve it, and then to use the technology available to test your ideas in a rigorous manner. And it's this process that just so happens to require the top three transferable skills wanted by employers. Complex problem solving, critical thinking, and creativity. So even if you're not able to find work in the specific technical area of your major, you will have the transferable skills to navigate the workforce in general. You just need to be open and flexible uh, to take those opportunities. So hopefully that's cheered you up a little bit after that really depressing graph earlier. So now we go to the very mysterious question that was up at the first part of my talk that I deliberately didn't refer to, just to keep you all wondering. What problem do you want to solve? So Jamie Cassett is the Chief Education Evangelist at Google, which basically means he uses technology to try and improve the quality of education. And I think that his comment here is the most succinct way to sum up the change of perspective that you need to take. Don't ask kids what they want to be when they grow up. Ask them what problem they want to solve. Because by focusing on the problem, they aren't limiting themselves to one single occupation. They are defining and anchoring their work life around the things that they need to learn and the skills they need to develop in order to resolve the problem. So for the rest of the conference, while you're listening to all of the amazing advice from our speakers today, I don't want you to be sat there asking yourself, what do I want to be? Ask yourself, what problem do you want to solve? And on the topic of amazing advice from amazing speakers, I'm going to ask Dave Summit, our keynote speaker, to come up. And I'm really, really grateful for him um, coming to speak to us today because he is a font of knowledge when it comes to practical careers advice. So please put your hands together to welcome Dave. Wow. Good day, everyone. Um, I heard the latest in uh, social media news uh, this morning. It was uh, oxygen and magnesium have started dating. And I said, oh, MJ. <laughs> um, I've come to talk to you today uh, about career stuff. Uh, I, I give lectures around Australia on how to make the transition from university to the workforce. I run a mentoring program for young scientists. Um, but why would you listen to me? Who am I? I'm a mover and shaker in this world. Um, <laughs> I, I've had a really interesting career because I was not the top student at university. I have never been the best candidate for any given job. What I have is a really interesting, varied business technical career where I've had the opportunity to learn how the process works. And that's what I want to talk to you a little bit today, is how does the whole process of developing and managing your own career work? How can you set yourself apart and give yourself the advantage so that you can go out and be and do what you want to do? So in very brief terms, I graduated university, undergraduate industrial chemistry, right here, back in and, um, and I went on a holiday, I took three months off, I went to Europe, I came back, I called the faculty and I said, have you heard about any jobs? And they said, yeah, there's a company that needs uh, warm bodies for the next three weeks. I said, great, I'm a hot star. Let's go. <laughs> As it happened, I then stayed at that company for seven years, walked right into a research chemist's job, and ended up running their research chemistry section, uh, running their project management, going up and up and up. I went off, I was a recruitment consultant for a while, which is part, about, part of how I know it all works. Uh, then I've been an entrepreneur, I've worked in commodities consulting, I spent six years as a company, a corporate spokes weasel for an ASX listed company. And so I've, 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 along the way I've been a master's degree in business. I've spent my career sitting between the technical and business paradigms, basically as a translator. 
really. Uh, and that's why you should listen to me, because I've been exposed to both worlds. I've had the opportunity to learn and make mistakes, but I've also had the opportunity to, because I've been so heavily in recruitment, you know, over the years I have employed, say, 100 people, and I have interviewed, I don't know, 1,000 more, who knows, to the point where their faces blur and what you see is trends, okay? Um, <laughs> thank you for you. I am on the cusp after 25 years in my career of becoming an overnight success. Come and check out in 12 months' time. Okay, so where should I start today? The good news or the bad news? Blair says bad news. Perfect. Bad news first. <laughs> okay, the bad news. Over the last 10 years and more, not one permanent full-time position has been created in Australia. All of the employment growth in Australia has been in casual and part-time work. It's a it's a frightening statistic, right? Um, from, the, from the statistics, they say that the median period of unemployment for a recent graduate is four months. After six months, 20% of graduates are still unemployed. And the numbers are worse for, for STEM careers. Now, I don't care who you are. I don't care how alpha your personality. Six months of unemployment is soul destroying. It will take the biggest ego and wear it down. But what I would say to you, it doesn't need to be you. But let's keep talking. You, overwhelming competition. You know, the most recent statistic I have is 2012. I couldn't find a more recent graduate one. But in 2012, 174,000 graduates came out of university. And I tell you, that number is going to be bigger now. It could easily be 200,000. Violet, would you agree with that? Mm -hmm. Um, on top of that, you have the graduates from last year who still haven't got employed. You've got all of the recent immigrants to the country who are very welcome and make our country stronger, but they are your competition. And they're walking into the country with better qualifications, more experience, and <laughs> more drive to succeed. These people are make it or break it coming into this country, right? So, so you are faced with a hell of a playing field. And if that doesn't frighten you, it should. But here's the good news. That's the last of the bad news I'm going to say to you today. Here's the good news. There is a world of opportunity out there. Now, Jamie said it very well. If you're doing a science career, a science study, most of you are not going to be career scientists. Most of you are not going to be... How many chemists are in the room? Awesome. <laughs> Um, I don't really know this, guys. Oxy uh, uh, two, two atoms are walking down the street, and one of them says, you know, mate, he says, I think I've lost an electron. <laughs> and he says, you're sure? He says, yeah, I'm positive. <laughs> <laughs> so you lab chemists, the chances are you're not going to be working in a white, cap, white lab coat in a lab for most of your career, right? There's, so, there's been X number of bios in this room. Um, you know, the chances are you're going to do all sorts of things. But as far as I'm concerned, that's a wonderful thing. You know, an accountant, what's his choice, her choice? It's to go out and be a bloody accountant. God, shoot me in the head now. Um, you know, lawyers have a little bit more flexibility, but us scientists, we've got the whole world ahead of us because everybody needs us. They don't need to know whether we know chemistry or biology, but the way that we think the fact that we think empirically and systematically, that we are taught right from the beginning to take our prejudices and set them aside and think about what is the true question, what is the true problem, how are we going to actually solve this problem. That's what makes us great employees. And so you're going to go through your whole career with the opportunity to go out and say, I can be anything. Do I get a little bit passionate? I do. <laughs> There's a phrase in life that says, one door closes and another door opens. And I don't believe that for a second. We are faced in a world where we are faced with thousands of open doors. And it's simply a case of having the skills and the drive to go and choose which door you want to walk through. Now, Jamie said, Jamie, one of you said, five careers over the course of, five, 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 five separate occupations over the course of your career. Absolutely. Now, 
Change is going to happen to you throughout your career, whether you like it or not. Embrace it. I've been made redundant, I don't even know, it's four, maybe five times? I guess I forget, I get old. <laughs> um, getting made redundant is awesome. You get paid this great big fat tax-free payout, and then you walk into another job, and you're richer. It's <laughs> awesome. You know, I once got made redundant for a job on a Friday. On a Monday, I called someone. I said, you want me to work for you? They said, yes, we do. I went in on the Wednesday, and I was earning this much money. I wanted this much, and I thought on my best day, I can get this much. They offered me this, and I asked for this, and I got it. <laughs> Three days after, finished, after being made redundant, with my nice fat payout, I started a new job with 50% more salary. Right? Now, how did I do that? I'm not the most spectacular candidate. You pick any job and you can find somebody who's going to be better than me on paper. But what I do is I know how the system works. <coughs> I know how, when Blair is going to employ me, what's going on in his head so that he can employ me. So that I can give him what he needs. And that's what I want to talk to you about today. right? So here it is. A good candidate can always find a good job quickly in any market. But a good candidate does not mean the highest academic results. It doesn't mean the most alpha personality. What it means is the person who knows how the system works, the person who knows how to get ahead. Getting a job is like running away from a lion. You don't have to be Usain Bolt. You don't have to be the fastest guy. You just have to be faster than the next guy. <laughs> so that's what I want to say. You, it, it, go into it with that positivity. If you know how to do it, if you put in the effort to get a, to, 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 to chase down that job, you can always get it. I once got a job. I've done my research on a company. I knew who I wanted to work for and why. And so I went and waited for the managing director of that company in the garage <coughs> in this building. And when he drove up, I walked up to that man and I said, Hi, I'm Dave Samet and I want to work for you for this reason. And he says, All right, you've got until the sixth floor. We got in the lift together. On the sixth floor, he handed me his card and said, Come back and see me next week. Right? Because in that situation, what I had done is that was a sales job. I had demonstrated the sales behavior by selling myself. Right? And so I was able to, to get that job. Now, of course, to, Doing that's pretty ballsy and it's not for every job. But uh, but what I'm saying is, if you know what you're doing, you can always go out. You don't have to wait for someone to advertise it. You can go out and get the job and take the job that you want when you're ready. So here's my single greatest career advice, and that is the power of the word yes. Yes is, out of 40 million words in the English language, Yes is the single most useful word that you know. Throughout your career, when somebody says, are you willing to give this a go? Here is an opportunity. Your first answer to anything should always be yes. And, I mean, ladies in the room, um, have, has everybody heard the meme, women should try to be like mediocre white men? So the theory goes that when faced with a new opportunity, a mediocre white bloke, he says, I've got 60, 70% of what I need, give it a ring. Whereas a typical woman will wait until she's got 100 or 110% of the, of the skills needed for that job, and then she'll say, okay, you should be out there, be like that mediocre white bloke, and go and grasp those opportunities. I'm saying that to all of the women in the room, right? Be the mediocre white bloke. <laughs> Um, the second thing about the power of yes is this. We are all scientists in this room. We know that a concept goes from being uh, an idea to a hypothesis to a theory to a law by the continual failure to disprove that idea. So our natural inclination when we're faced with a new idea is to hold it up to the light and to look for the holes, right? That is the single most career destructive thing that you can do. When you are faced with a new idea in your career, your first response must be yes. Yes, that's an interesting idea. Yes, maybe we can find a way to improve that idea. But your first response should always be yes. You're, you're young, you're energetic. 
Relentless enthusiasm is one of your greatest assets. It's what employers are looking for from you. Okay, so let me tell you a little bit about understanding the job market. The most important lesson about the job market is it's nothing personal. It's not about you. When I'm employing, when I, when I advertise a position, let's talk about advertise positions. I am going to get at least 100 applications. At least. My record, I had 450 applications for a graduate chemist role. Now, when I review your resume, I am going to give it at most 90%, of it, 90 seconds of my time. A professional recruiter will give it less than 30 seconds of their time. And when I review your resume, I am not looking for a reason to include you for that job. I'm looking for a reason to exclude you. I'm looking for the mistakes. I'm looking for the spelling errors. But God, we live in an era of computers, and I still get, I, I get resumes with spelling errors. What the hell, man? So from my 100 applications, I'm trying to very quickly drop 70 of them. Then I'm going to start reading, the, the, then I'm going to go back and I'm going to read the next 30, and I'm going to reject 20 of them. And then I'm going to take those 10 and I'm going to think about it, I'll probably call 7 or 8 of them, and then I'm going to uh, interview 3. Okay. So throughout that process, you're not even a name on the piece of paper, because obviously I'm trying to avoid letting unknown biases influence how I recruit, so I don't even read your name. I skip past your name, I go straight down to what are your qualifications, what are your experience, what does it say in your cover letter? That's what I'm looking at. And I don't know who you are. I don't know whether you're male, female, young, old, don't care, not allowed to care. Rules of the law says I'm not allowed to care. All right? So I'm looking for the, 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 the underneath, and it's nothing personal. I can't afford to care about all 100 of you, right? That's the reason I got out of recruitment consulting. I loved the people aspect. But I had to say, for every time I got to say yes for a job, I had to say no 200 times. And it just, it just wore me down. It, just, it was hard on the soul. Um, but the point is, as an employer, what I'm looking for is the business investment. If I'm going to employ you, it's going to cost me at least $30,000 and probably closer to $50,000. Not just your direct wages, not just the direct employment cost, but the disruption to my business, the time that you're going to take away from my productive employees. Because you know, as, as, as university graduates, you haven't learned a single useful skill for the workplace. You've learned a language so that when you come into my workplace, you speak the language of my workplace so that I can, I can teach you what you need to know to do my job. Right? There's a classic joke that the the graduate engineer turns up for his first day on the job, and his foreman hands him a broom. Graduate engineer. And the foreman says, oh, I'm so sorry, how do you that back there? This is how you use it. <laughs> right? Um, so when you are pitching yourself to an employer, you need to pitch yourself as a business asset, as an investment. You need to show that employer why you are worth that $50,000 investment. And as scientists, you're not trained in that concept of thinking, right? But as, if you can think that way, then you separate yourself from the field, okay? And that's what the whole job process is about, is separating yourself from the morass of other students out there. So if you can pitch yourself as a business asset, well, look, when I did my master's degree in business, I already had an undergraduate degree in science, and I did a master's degree in business. Did having an MBT on my on my resume make one single scrap of difference to my employability? Absolutely not. But did you know uh, uh, career management? We talked about career management. Uh, Violet talked about manager and career. I changed the way that I branded myself. I changed the way that I pitched myself to employers. And on the basis of saying, I have these business skills, on the basis, and I have these technical skills, I would pitch myself to smaller employers and say, look, you need skills across a broad range. You can't afford to bring in a specialist for this and a specialist for that and a specialist. I'm a generalist. I sit across both camps, and I can serve you. OK, I won't be a specialist accountant. I won't be a specialist whatever. But what I will do is serve you across a broad range. The ability to pitch myself that way has made a vast difference to how how I got jobs and how I, how I extended in my career. Okay, 
So your challenge is to believe, to make the employer believe that you're worth that investment. Now, Violet, I'm sure, will be able to tell you that when it comes to employability, it's not what you tell the employer, it's what you show the employer. Employment is all about what they call behavioural uh, based recruiting. It's the best predictor of your future behaviour is your past behaviour. So you need to show by your actions that you are going to be the person that that, person, that, that, that employer needs, not tell them. Right? You say, oh yeah, look, if you employ me, I'll work really hard. Screw that. You have to show by working hard to get the job that you're going to work hard when you've got the job. Right? So, look, look at it this way. Every, every year, every six months, we see in the newspaper an, a, 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 an ad, a, a, somebody saying, oh, I've submitted a thousand job applications and I haven't had a single interview. Who's read that, ad, that article? Right? Everybody. I'll tell you, that person submitted, submitted a thousand shit applications. <laughs> I'm completely unsurprised that they didn't get, a, didn't even get an interview. If I'm trying to score this nice looking fellow at the back of the room with a rock, if I, I can throw a thousand rocks, I'll never hit him. I get a good solid round up and I hoik it right up there, I'm going to score him right between the eyes. Four or five rocks, I'm going to get him. And the same is true, no offense, <laughs> the same is true of going for a job. If you put 15 minutes into a job application, you can put 15 minutes in a thousand times and you'll never get a job. If you put eight hours into your job preparation, your job application preparation, you do it five times, I guarantee you, money back guarantee, you'll get a job. Okay? Alright. Um, so, you're dealing with a relatively flat field when you're dealing with other, other graduates. Graduates are basically a commodity. Does everybody understand the difference between commodity and a specialist product? Right? Copper metal is copper metal. It, you know, it, it has, it, whether it came from China or the US or Australia, it's all just copper metal. But my iPhone is different from the Android. You guys are all copper metal right now. You're all basically the same. You have more or less the same skills, more or less the same experience. Um, it's going to be assumed that you're all pretty keen, you know, you're going to say, oh yeah, you know, enthusiastic, yeah. I wouldn't expect that, you yeah, know, yeah. why doesn't you out again? So you have to be able to distinguish yourself from the herd. But here's the thing, it is so remarkably easy. Because if I said to, okay, young lady here, would you normally spend eight hours on a job application? Not that long. If I said to you the difference between getting a job via the usual crap applications and getting a job via putting eight hours in is three months of un unemployment. At $60,000, that's $60,000 a year, that's $15,000. If I said to you, for eight hours work, would you, would, would, for $15,000, would you do eight hours work? Yes. Yeah. They're the same bloody question. Think of it in terms of dollars. The effort for the reward for effort, right? And okay, so <laughs> why would I put such a desperately sad image of a nerdy little day with his broken wing, eight years old, and his voice came? It's because when you walk away from today, if you remember nothing else, burn that sad image into your head, <laughs> and. And say to yourself the scout motto, be prepared. The entire job application process is about preparedness. You've got to do your research. You've got to do your preparation. You read the job ad, right? I mean, okay. when I put a job ad out, I always put a, a, a booby trap in my job ad. You know? I put AAS experience preferred. And your typical graduate will call me up and say, yeah, I, I studied, I haven't had, actually got any actual AAS experience, but I studied at university. And I say, great, how does it work? Oh, I have to go back to my books a lot. Boom, you're out. That's why that's in there. I, could, I don't care whether you've got AAS experience, I can teach you that in a day. I do it for exactly that reason, because the graduate who hasn't taken the trouble to go and look that up in their books before they call me, is not someone I want working for me. It's the behaviour that says, I don't really care about this job, right? You know, I'm just going to call up, see how I go. Okay. Right? 
I want somebody who wants to work for me. I want somebody who says, I want this job, that if you invest $50,000 in me, I'm going to stay for long enough to, to pay back that investment threefold. Right? Because for every dollar your employer pays you, they are expecting to earn $3. And the best thing that you can possibly do to an employer is say, for every dollar you pay me, this is how you're going to pay, you're going to get paid back $3, right? Now I told you that example of getting paid the big money, right? For every dollar that I earned at that company, I returned seven. <coughs> and I tracked it, and I was able to show that employer and future employers, that's me. That's the investment that you make in me. You may pay me the big dollars, but it's bloody well worth it. So you have to treat the job application process as a job in itself. The behavior of working for the job is the same as the behavior of working in the job. Okay? I mean, I've said if you haven't spent four hours on it, you haven't, you haven't been thorough enough. I say four hours on the application itself, four hours on the preparation for the interview. At least, minimum, minimum. And what that means is, okay, so you read the job application, you say, what does the job app actually say? What are the skills required for this job? What does the application not say? What's in between the lines? What's it not saying? Okay? And then you be careful. I mean, look, in every single job application, I put attention to detail is important because for my work, attention to detail is key. I can't afford to be checking your work all the time. So I need to, when, when, when you hand me your work, I need to know that it's right. Now, the, and, I, and at the bottom of every ad, I say, for questions, contact Dave Sammet. Here's my phone number. Here's my email address. And yet the number of applications that I get saying to whom it may concern, are you kidding me? Right? Um, Uh, it's probably worth noting, why am I here today? I'm not trying to recruit anyone. I'm not trying to make a dollar out of any of this. This, this, has, this career stuff has nothing to do with my business. The reason I'm here today is because I got extraordinarily lucky right from the gates. I've had this fabulous career all the way through. And sure, I've worked hard and I've made the most of my opportunities. But I've seen so many people struggle. And it's incumbent upon me to give back to you, the next generation. I don't want any of you to be unemployed for four months or six months. I want each of you to walk out of university with a job. And that is perfectly possible if you approach it right. Now, I know that you're in a, in a range of ages here. Some of you right from, from early university, some to, 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 to honours year. I would say this to you. Start as early as you can. If you're in your office here and you're coming up to the end, look, I've got to say, Jamie, you've got to put a head on your shoulders. So you're doing well, all right? Um, I like what you had to say. I think you'll do great. The, the, the thing that you can do is that preparedness. You're, it amazes me that a student will come to university. They will spend what? Over four years, they'll spend 10,000 hours studying. They'll spend... God knows how many hours at the bar. <laughs> and they will spend virtually no time at all thinking about how am I actually going to get a job once I finish this. It blows me away. How can, how, can the, how can it be that disproportionate? How can it be? And, and, I, and don't get me wrong, I was no different. You know, I, I just thought, oh yeah, I'll come out, so give me a job, should be sweet, bro. Right? Um, and for me it was, but for most it's not. I just got, it was, for me it was just dumb luck. Okay, now here's a key message. Skills can be taught, personality can't, okay? I can teach, you've learned your language here at university, I can teach you to do the job that I need you to do. What I can't teach you is the personality, how to be good at the job. So I, a few years ago I had a young engineer working for me, we used to call him Ethelred. <coughs> Ethelred was an early king of England. He was green, wow. He knew nothing about nothing. <coughs> Um, but his attitude was right. He, he learned, he paid attention, he, he learned from his mistakes. Right? Thomas Edison once said, I haven't failed, I've just learned a thousand ways that don't work. We learn from our mistakes, it's part of the scientific method, right? You know, I mean, when I do, so I do minerals consulting work, I'm a world expert in it, possibly now a grant of minerals chemistry, and I provide services to mines and industrial facilities around the world. 
And when I do those services, I say to my clients, you know, some of these tests, they're going to fail. Because, no, yeah, fine, if I, 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 might, I might get it right the first time. Even if I get it right the first time, I'm still going to push it until it fails because I need to know where the boundaries are. When you're going to build that industrial facility, I need to know how far can we push it down and save cost before it's going to break. So your skills can be taught, your personality can't. I, I can't teach you to be a good employee. I can only teach you the skills to do the job. And there's a far different thing, right? So what are employers actually looking for? This is, I think, a, this is a really interesting survey on graduate careers. Graduatecareers.com is actually a really useful resource. Um, much like what I was saying, all right. uh, interpersonal skills. Interpersonal skills are perfect. Are the most important thing, right? Your ability to communicate. You're useless to me if all of the ideas rest inside your head and you're not interchanging with other employers. Okay? And there's virtually no job where that's not true. What's really interesting, I'm just to jump down to the bottom, leadership skills. If I had a dollar for every time a young person had told me about what a great leader they are, I would be, I am a very leader. Um, I, don't give, I don't give a rat's ass what you think your leadership skills are. There's no one for you to lead. <laughs> you're going to come into my workplace and you're either going to show that you fit in great with that workplace and that you can carry people along with you or you're not. But I don't care what you think your leadership skills are. Okay? So, um, there, it's all about distinguishing yourself. Two of my favourite questions. Tell me something about yourself that, you, that I can't learn by reading your resume. Now, most young people will just repeat something from their resume to me. Okay? Most young people struggle with this question. But I'm looking for flair, I'm looking for interest. I don't care what your answer is, just tell me something that shows me that you can think. Particularly think on your feet. Right? But here's the great thing, you don't have to think on your feet. If you prepare before you go to the bloody interview, then you've already got your answer. I mean, do you think those great stand-up comedians just think of those jokes on the spot? No, they've worked on them offline, they've tested them. Right? Do you know you can walk into an interview with your notebook that says, I prepared for this, and I prepared my star story. Everybody know what star stories are? Situation, task, action, and response, right? Your behavioral-based interviewing. If you don't, well, it's going to teach you all about um, um, Or the careers section of the university, there's an entire lectures about this. But you can have it all written down. A, 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 an interview is an open book exam. And when somebody says you this question, you know, tell me about a, a time when you've had trouble with, a, with another, another employee, you can say, yeah, I thought you might ask me a question like this. I can see why it's important for the job, because I did my research for this job, and here's what I wanted to tell you. Right? And most importantly, the question I love to ask people, I have 100 resumes in front of me. What makes you different to those other 100 people? Because I guarantee you, there is something about you that makes you special, that makes you different. And if, you're, if, you're, if your potential employer doesn't ask you, bloody well tell them. You get to the question section and, and, and they say, do you have any questions for us? And you say, yes, I do. Of course you do. You say, what are the things that are going to make me most successful in this role? Great question to ask, right? It says, I'm already putting myself in here and I want to be great at this job, right? But you can also say, look, I don't think... You know, we've talked all about the role, but I think there's something that we haven't chat, and I haven't had a chance to tell you what I think makes me special. Tell them. It's the one time in your life where blowing your trumpet is not only good, it's encouraged. Okay? Um, the very best candidate who ever applied for a job with me, he called me up, he said, Mr. Sammy, he says, do you have a few minutes to chat? Always a very useful thing to ask at the beginning of that conversation. Um, and he says, oh, you know, I've read the job ad, he says, I, I, I'd like to ask you a little bit more about this position. Yeah, we talked about the job, we talked about 10 minutes. He said, thank you very much, Mr. Sam. End of conversation. So far, so good. He demonstrated he had good communications, I could, you know, I could clearly communicate with him. But here's the thing, three days later he called me back. Now this was a research chemist position I was advertising. He called me back and he said, Mr. Sam, what was it to be to call Mr. Sam? He said, Mr. Sam, he says, uh, uh, I was really interested in our conversation. I made some notes at the end of our conversation. I went to the library and I did some more research and now I would like to ask you this. That guy had the job before he ever walked through the door. Why? Because I needed a research chemist. He'd gone out and researched the chemistry of what I was doing. It's not that hard. Four hours in the library and he had the job. Okay. Um, 
something's gone wrong with that presentation slide. <coughs> the most important one here. <laughs> Where did people find, even at the graduate level, you are far more likely to find a job through a network, right? For two reasons. Firstly, you're going to hear about a lot more opportunities than are advertised. And secondly, because the field of candidates through your network opportunity is much smaller. If I advertise a position, I'm going to have at least 100 people. If your network tells you that, you've got, that I've got a thing, you might be competing against four or five. The odds are better. Okay? So what can you do while you're here at university is network your ass off. I don't care whether you're starting first year. Network. Your network is your peers. This is the great mistake that I made as an undergraduate. I was a prickly bastard, and I didn't, get, I, I didn't take the trouble to get on with this. Not get on with, we were all friendly enough. But I, I, never, I never took the trouble to realize that those people around me were going to be a massive professional asset to me over time. Right? Um, your network is a business asset. It's about trust. Decisions are so complex in this world. There's so much information. A business person needs an ability to shortcut the process. They don't have time to research every decision. And one of the ways that you shortcut is you go to your network, someone you trust, and you say, what decision should I make? So it's more than just hearing about the opportunities. It's the way that you can be more efficient in your job. More efficient in your job means more money for your employer. Or, if you're self-employed like me, more money for you. <laughs> Um, so your network is your peers here at university, your academics. Your academics want to help you. They want you to be successful in life. I could make a joke that they weren't. They would just want to see someone else do it, but I would not make that joke. Um, it's your alumni association. It's your professional association. Each of you has a professional association. I'm going to put a little hand up for our Royal Australian Chemical Institute. We're awesome. Um, but you go to events. It's not enough to just join a professional association. You have to go to events. You have to go and make your face known. And then I guarantee you, I mean, the RACI has 4,000 members who want to help establish you in your career. We want you to see the value of being a member and become a member for the rest of your life. Right? But I can't help you unless I know who you are, unless you come into events, unless I get a chance to get to know who you are and what you need and what you're interested in. Right? Um, now, I'm going to be giving a whole talk <coughs> later on about how to network. Um, so I'm not, I'm going to, because I'm running out of time, so I'm going to skip this slide. But I will say there's a flyer out front called Building Your Network. In addition, there's a flyer out front um, where, see, I, I've got a whole lecture series uh, called Understanding the Job Market. Two and a half hours of a bald and fat bloke uh, uh, banging on, but two and a half hours of actually quite useful, practical advice on how you can separate yourself from the herd. Uh, eminently worthwhile. There's a flyer out front that uh, it's a YouTube video. Um, Violet will also have a copy and will provide it to anyone who wants it. Um, but yeah, look, what I would say about networking, networking is like a chemical reaction. It's got an activation energy. You get over that activation energy and everything goes from there, right? So you just, look, I know how hard it is to walk into a room full of strangers and figure out how do I, how do, I do this, right? So, before my whole networking session, the one thing I would say to you is this. If you walk into a room full of strangers and you don't know who to talk to, there's a very simple tactic that you can do. And that is, go to the organiser and say, Hi, I'm Dave. You don't have to say it like that. <laughs> that would be a bit confusing, really. Um, but you go out there and you say, Hi, I'm Dave. Um, I'm new here. Can you recommend who I should be speaking to? This is what I'm interested in. Can you recommend somebody that I should speak to? Let the, and chances are they'll walk you across the room and introduce you to someone, and you've got your start, right? It doesn't have to be hard. Um, um, the other thing is, every single one of you, who has a business card here? Apart from the professionals. <laughs> every single one of you should have a business card. They're cheap. They come from China. <laughs> You should be spraying these things out like you're trying to destroy the world. <laughs> and on this card should be your name, your contact details with a professional email address, hornydog 64 and your photo. Now, I would never put my photo on a resume because of putting your photo on a resume you invites someone to make a prejudgment about you, but on your business, oh, on your, your undergraduate card, hell yes, because somebody has to have a chance to remember who you are. Okay. 
And you should, on that card, it should be on a paper that you can print on. Don't get one of those glossy papers so that the person can write on the back of it and make sure that it's blank on the back so that they can make notes about you. And you're also going to make notes about them and then you're going to follow up with them. Because networking is like farming. You're sowing the seeds today for the harvest you're going to reap next season. So you're going to follow up with them. You're going to maintain contact with them. You're going to send them papers and articles and stuff, but not every day. Once every three months, once every six months. And then when you come to close to walking for a job, you're going to send to your entire network and say, hi, I'm, I'm coming up to graduation. I'm going to be looking for employment. If you hear about anything, please let me know. Now, I, did, I, I, I took a mentee of mine to, a, to an event once. Um, I introduced him to eight people. From that one event and that one introduction, where he spoke to each one for not more than five minutes, he had ten job opportunities raised with him. <coughs> one event, he got a job. It's, it's not that freaking hard. Right? And the reason it's not that hard is because most of the people that you're competing with hell, most of the people in this room aren't going to do it. Okay, you're going to listen to me, you're going to go home, you're going to forget all about that ball and tummy bloke, and you're going to carry on with your lives. A few of you are going to spark. Okay, so, little plug for the Royal Australian Chemical Institute. We have um, a Facebook page for young, young chemists. Um, I also have a, a DCS Technical has a Facebook page, so it's my website. I run a regular careers blog. Uh, it's all about, like, I talk about practical advice. I don't talk about how to fill in a resume. I don't talk about how to, I talk about the psychology of how it works. Now, what, what young Blair here is thinking about, um, you know, um, well, you really don't want to get Blair's here. <laughs> I've got the, the YouTube video series. Um, it's all of that stuff. I want to help you. You can get in contact with me. I will read your resume. I'll give you feedback. Right? I just need to know who you are and how I can help. Right? That's why they made me an adjunct senior lecturer here at the university, because I spent 15 years trying to help. Um, yeah, so that's the DCS technical stuff. So my last, my last uh, statement. Finding a job is supposed to be hard work. It's supposed to be hard work, but if you take it, but it doesn't take very much effort to set yourself apart. If you do your research, if you do your preparation, and you use your network, you will, will find a job, a great job, and quickly. I guarantee it. Okay. Thank you very much.